If you have a Bible, turn please to Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Luke, the fifth chapter, begin with verse 1, and we will eventually work our way through verse 11. As is abundantly obvious on our campus at this time of year, it is graduation. Graduation is almost here, and this, understandably, is a time when people think about the future. Uh, certainly for our graduates, if, uh, if you're graduating from eighth grade, you're thinking about your future in high school, that grand universe known as secondary education, and they are looking forward to you being there. If you are a high school graduating senior, perhaps the future weighs even more on you. You're thinking about, well, I, I'm ready to head out maybe for a, a, a vocation of some sort. Uh, maybe you're headed off to college and you're not quite sure exactly what major to take, what career to prepare for. And even if you're not graduating from any particular educational institution, it is a good time of year to think what should, keyword there, what should the future hold for me and for you. Well, good news. Luke chapter 5 actually talks a fair amount about how to find the best future, the future that God has in mind for you as a faithful follower of Christ. Uh, let's do some digging here. Luke chapter 5, let's read verse 1 here and on. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Four lessons this morning from the story of Jesus next to the Sea of Galilee. And I'm going to crane my neck here and make sure I see what's coming. If you want to find your future, a great lesson from this particular story, number one, is this. To find the best future, let Jesus in your boat. To find the best future, let Jesus in your boat. And some of you think, I don't have a boat. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. You see, your boat is your version of your future plans for yourself. That's your boat. And most everybody has a boat in that sense. And Peter is no exception here. This is Peter's future that he and Jesus are in right now. Now, to be clear, Jesus has spent a fair amount of time in the present of Peter. Not the future, but the present. You see, this story takes place, let me just put some stuff up here on the screen for you. Uh, this is, of course, a, a map of Israel. Uh, down here we have the Gaza Strip, which has been in the news quite a bit here recently. Uh, you have uh, Jerusalem, Jericho up here, working our way up north, past Nazareth, and take a right to the east there. This is the Sea of Galilee. And on the northern edge is a town called Capernaum. Capernaum today is a fairly well-preserved uh, ruins uh, that are there. Uh, it's well-preserved because this is a place that Jesus spent a great deal of time at. Uh, to me, when I went over to uh, visit in the Holy Land, this was one of the most interesting places that I went to uh, because it was so clear there, there's almost no disagreement that Jesus was here. We even have the synagogue uh, that he did a number of miracles in. Also there, you see here on the screen, uh, there is this large building here. Uh, our Catholic friends have built a shrine over this. They say that this is Peter's house. Now, there are some scholars that disagree with that, as with probably 98% of the sites that you see over in the Holy Land. Someone will disagree with it, but there is some consensus that this may well have been the Apostle Peter's very own house. Well, that being the case, if we were to read in Luke chapter 4, we would find that Jesus has been to Peter's house. Not only has he been to the synagogue where Peter worships in the present, he's been to the house that Peter lives in in the present. He's healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. Jesus goes there, rebukes the fever. Word spreads. People come to Capernaum near Peter's house there to be healed. Jesus has spent a great deal of time in Peter's present day reality. And then... 
Jesus steps into Peter's future. Peter's way to make money to feed his family is in that boat. Peter's retirement someday is going to be funded through what happens in this boat. Peter's reputation as a business person in the community, whether it's in Capernaum or the surrounding villages that were around there, all hinges on what happens in this boat. Peter's future, his understanding of his future, and his plans for his future are all wrapped up in this boat. And he has just let Jesus into it. Now, if that doesn't strike some of you as at least a little bit dangerous, you're not paying attention. Because what if Jesus changes your boat? What if Jesus is led into your plans and he changes them? The gall of the creator to change your plans for things. Now, let's be honest here. Most of the time when we think about our future, particularly when we're younger, I mean, yes, there's some selfishness involved with it, but it's, but it's almost more of a natural reaction. I mean, when you're, if, if uh, many a little boy has seen a fire truck go by and say, I will be a fireman. Or maybe as we get older, maybe there's, there's a teacher in school, and we really admire the teacher. We say, I'm going to be a teacher. Okay. Those types of things happen with almost, we don't even have to plan it. It's just kind of natural, right? And, and if we're really honest, most of the time those plans revolve around what, what we want, what, what, what we think would be good. It's our plans for ourselves. We're looking towards our future and too often, even Christians will rarely let Jesus into their boat. Hmm. Well, uh, Peter does this. And although Peter's faith is immature at this point, I can't help but think that at that moment, there's just a little bit of Peter that gets a universal truth. Here's that universal truth. Jesus only asks us for one thing, and that one thing is everything we've got. That's all. That's all Jesus asked for. Just one thing, and that one thing is everything that we've got. And the reason that he asks for that, well, the answer is, is at least twofold. Number one, when Jesus died on the cross, he took my sin, your sin, everybody's sin who's ever lived, everybody who's ever going to live who's going to sin, all of those sins Jesus took on himself on the cross, didn't deserve it, didn't need to, but that's exactly what he did. And in taking those sins on the cross, he then, he then gives his life, he dies so that we do not have to. He rises from the grave to new life so that we can do the same if we wish. If we put our trust in him, we too are given this brand new life. The creator of the universe dying for us, and he would have done it, we are told, if we were the only human being on the planet. Creator God dying for us, and all he asks in return is everything that we have. It's the bargain of eternity. You win the spiritual lottery. All you have to give is everything, and God gives you eternal life forever with him in his kingdom. And Peter, at some point here, gets this. I need to let Jesus in my boat. And Jesus comes in. The question begs to be asked. Have you done the same? Have you let Jesus into your boat, your plans for the future? Whether you're a graduate or whether you've long since graduated, you're out in the workforce, it, it, it doesn't matter. The question, the challenge for each of us is the same. If we call Jesus Lord, have we let him into our boat? Have we let him decide what's going to happen with our futures? If you haven't, I just want to gently challenge you to do so. There's no better future than the one that Jesus has in mind for you but you'll never find it unless you let him in the boat. And indeed, when you let Jesus in the boat, things can happen. For instance, let's do a little reading here. Verse four, 
He's asked Peter permission. Jesus then gets in the boat. He's got a little space now. He's preaching, teaching to the people. He, he finishes that. Verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Lesson number two, if you want to find God's future for you. Lesson number two is this. Sometimes God's guidance for your future sounds stupid. Obey anyway. Sometimes God's guidance for your future sounds stupid. Obey it anyway. Obey that guidance anyway. You know, we need to be clear here. Just because something is stupid doesn't mean it's from God. Are we all clear on that? Okay, there are some people that the stupider it sounds, the more clearly they are impressed. This is of divine origin, okay? That is, that is not the case. Nor am I saying that if something doesn't sound stupid, it must not be from God, okay? We have to be careful here. There are some zealots among us who insist that God always works through miraculous means, and actually we're told that God works through general universal principles that he has set in motion. However, I am nonetheless saying that sometimes God's counsel, the best counsel that we could ever have, just sounds like foolishness to our ears, just as it did for Peter. And check this out. Let me put another picture up here on the screen for you. Uh, this is... Uh, this is Capernaum. This is the place. I mean, there's not a huge, Capernaum was not a huge town, uh, and the waterfront there, therefore, is not that big. You, you see here, uh, looking out, this is down towards, if you could see really well, way off in the distance there is where the Jordan River uh, drains out of the Sea of Galilee. The water is clear. You, even today, with, uh, even with Tiberius polluting the place uh, over there, uh, it is still quite clear. You can go out 8, 10 feet, and you can still see the bottom, and so can the fish. So understand what Peter is facing here at this moment. Jesus, a man that Peter has obviously deep and very growing respect and suspicions that he might be more than a man. And yet Jesus has just asked him to make a complete fool of himself. Peter, who is obviously a fisherman, he's got a boat. Jesus is standing. There's nets right there. Peter should know what he's doing, right? And Peter knows that only an idiot fishes in the day because the fish will see the nets and they'll swim the other direction, right? And for a moment there, it must have crossed Peter's mind. Is Jesus not smarter than a fish? What do I do here? Add to this that all of the Capernaumites, what do you call somebody from Capernaum? I don't know, a Capernaumer? Somebody, all the people from Capernaum are undoubtedly there at the shore. Jesus has healed people miraculously. Peter's mother-in-law has been healed. They have reason to be there. They're, the beach is full. That's why Jesus had to move back. Probably surrounding towns have their village people that are gathered there as well, and they're all looking out, and Peter has just been asked to make a fool of himself. Hmm. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Well, Peter decides that uh, he is going to try to do two things. Number one, he attempts to preserve his professional dignity. Uh, Lord, we have worked hard all night. <laughs> Nighttime. That's when this happens, right? At night. I'm not a fool. I know how to do this. We've fished all night. And then secondly, he seeks to defer out of respect to Jesus. He says, but because you say so, not me, <laughs> not my partners, but because you say so, I will throw the nets out. And he obeys what God has told him to do even though it sounded stupid. And the results when we do this, when we, when we know that it's the voice of God, even if it sounds foolish, and we know that it's the voice of God, when we obey it, great things can happen. Some of you have heard a story, uh, if you've been with me, yea, verily, since 2004, you have heard this story before, but it bears repeating. When I graduated from Forest Lake Academy, I went uh, not to Southern, as did most of, of my uh, classmates. Uh, Southern's a very good school, but I wanted to be an engineer. 
And so I went to Walla Walla. That's where you went then. That's often where people will go now. Uh, it has one of the best engineering programs uh, in Adventism. And so I went to become a mechanical engineer. I wanted to work for one of the big three in Detroit designing cars. And ever since I was this big, that's what I wanted to do. And when I found out there was a name for it, engineering, I quickly adopted that as my own. This is going to be my plan for my future. My boat was headed to Detroit. So I get to Walla Walla, and every engineering major is required to take Introduction to Engineering. So I go there, I'm a little bit early, there's only a few students in the class, the professor has not started his lecture yet. You can hear pretty well the conversations going on around, and I hear the conversation of some fellow freshman engineering majors. And basically the conversation went like this, hey man, do you, do you know how much money, do you know how much money a first year engineer makes with Boeing? Uh, Boeing, for those of you who don't know, a big aerospace manufacturer located mostly in the greater Seattle area in Washington state. Lots of engineering grads from Walla Walla ended up working for Boeing. And this person was saying, man, it's going to be awesome. We're going to make 60 grand right out of college. Now, 60 grand even today, that's not bad. If you're a graduate straight out of college, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's not bad. What place to start? And back then, that was great. And they're talking, oh, yeah, it's going to be so good. We're going to make so much money doing this. And I had a series of thoughts that came into my head. Number one, this sounds selfish. Number two, if it's selfish like this on this side of graduation, I wonder what it would be like on the other side of graduation, spending the rest of my life in, in this profession. And then I thought, hmm, if I didn't become an engineer, what would I become? And immediately a thought came into my head, well, that's easy, you should be a pastor. The dumbest thing I had ever heard to that point. Be a pastor, are you kidding? Now, no offense, ladies. I thought to myself, that's like becoming a woman. I mean, because it's a feminine role, right? I mean, this caretaking thing, kissing babies and, and you know, hand-holding and whatnot like that. And I wasn't into that stuff at all. I thought, no way, I am not going to become somebody that I'm not, right? And I put the idea straight out of my head. Now, to be clear, I have since met many generous engineers. So those of you that are engineers, welcome. We're glad that you're here with us today. Okay. But at that moment, at that time, in my immature you know, freshman male mind, that's what I thought about. And the answer was in my head that came there, well, that's easy. You should be a pastor instead. Uh, no, 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 no. Put it out of my mind, went through the class, went to lunch after that. Now, I knew a handful of people uh, from outside uh, that also had come to Walla Walla. I just met a few people from my hall. We're sitting there at the table in the cafeteria. And about halfway through the conversation, I say, so I'm not thinking of changing my major, but if I did, what do you think I should be? And they said, well, that's easy. You should be a pastor. And I thought, how did I get such terrible friends so early in my career here at Walla Walla? You would think I could choose better quality, right? Is this? And so obviously these people didn't know me well enough, right? Because they would have never said that if they really knew me. So I decided I was going to write a letter, okay? So I went to the quarry and I carved out a slab of rock and I got my hammer. No, it wasn't quite that old. We used letters and paper and stuff in those days. We licked a stamp. You had to lick stamps in those days. Do you remember that? You lick a stamp, right? Don't lick them now. That self-adhesive stuff, it just sticks to your lips. But uh, you put, I put the letter in, I wrote in there, and basically I asked some friends of, uh, I guess I can't say back east because that's where we are, out this direction. I said, uh, not that I'm thinking of changing my major, but if I did, what do you think I should be? And about a week and a half later, the answer came back. Well, that's easy. You should be a pastor. Now I was deeply disappointed because obviously I had years of choosing bad friends, right? And I became, I was getting very, very irritated, but I also knew I better start paying attention. You see, I learned from an early age that, that if God is, is speaking, you need to pay attention. And I did not want to pay attention. This was, this was foolishness to me. I had absolutely no interest in becoming a pastor, but this was too much. I thought, okay, God, what are you trying to tell me? Well, that began a process of intense prayer and searching. I sought out other pastors in the community. I said, how did you know that you were supposed to become a minister? They said, well, they explained a little bit about their calling. They said, well, you know, what, what about skills? And so I, I talked about some things. They said, you know, public speaking, you know, leadership, that type of thing. I said, well, check, 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 okay. And more and more, I'm coming to believe that maybe God wants me to change my major to theology so that I can become a pastor. And I am, I am not liking that at all. 
And finally, at the end of two weeks, I didn't know it was going to be the end, but it ended up being that way. Two weeks in, into this, 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 this sweat box of, of destroying my life, right? I go to the end of the track there at Walla Walla. They had a big, long running track there, and I was, I was leaning against my bike at the end there. The sun was setting. It was Sabbath evening, and nobody else around, and I was having it out with God. Now, I'm not recommending what I did. I'm just going to tell you what happened, okay? Uh, I am angry. I am sweating. Uh, blood pressure, it, 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 my, my heart is pumping, and I cannot believe that God is actually going to ask me to do this, all right? And finally, it just felt like the spiritual pressure was relentless. God was not letting up. And finally, I shook my fist at heaven, and I said, fine, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. And instantly, I was involuntarily completely calm. I went from sweaty, red-faced, you know, heart rate racing, angry, whatnot, to just whoosh. It was like the finger of God had just gone and wiped away my agitation. And I knew my answer. And then I got nervous and upset all over again because it was pretty clear that God had just affirmed what I was supposed to be doing. And I rode my bike back to my, my dorm room, and on Monday morning, I rode my bike to the registrar's office, and I changed my major from engineering to theology. Now, it took me five, five and a half years to even get to the place where I could like the idea sufficiently that I made it through interviews so I could get a job, okay? And it still was a year or two after that that it finally was made clear to me why it was that God would put somebody who so very much disliked pastoral ministry into pastoral ministry. That's a sermon for another time, but I'll just say this about my, my story. By the grace of God, I've been able to preach and to teach about Jesus, something that I could not imagine having done before. I've been able to do it not just in this country, but in other places. I've been able to advocate for Adventist education in, in places that I never, never would have dreamed I would have been able to go. And it's not that I'm the world's greatest speaker or teacher. Sometimes you just have to endure what it is that I've got for you that day. But by the grace of God, I, I feel that I've been able to be a blessing to people, none of which would have happened if I had not said yes to what seemed to me to be foolishness at the time. What foolishness is God whispering in your ear these days? What plans is he whispering in your ear that maybe to you just don't make sense? If you feel that he's whispering those kinds of things to you, make sure that it's the voice of God. Ask for other wise followers of Christ, maybe for their assistance. Pray, pray. And if in the end you discover that God is the one who is whispering that foolishness in your ear, then do it. Obey. Follow it. Because again, there's no better future than the one that God has in store for you. This brings us to verse 6. The nets have been let down in the water. Peter has obeyed. Verse 6, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Lesson number three. If you want to find God's future for you, is this. Let Christ not cash determine your future. Let Christ, not cash, determine your future. Every fisherman's dream for Peter has just come true. I mean, I, I understand that, that fishermen tell stories. 
I mean, I know that all the fishermen in this congregation are, are honest and true. They would never exaggerate the size of a fish that they caught, right? Peter has the ultimate story, and it's true. Hey, guys, guess what happened? I caught so many fish, and it was high noon that my boat almost sank. And then my partners came. We filled it up, and it almost sank, too. Can you believe it? I mean, people are like, if you weren't there, you'd never believe it. Every fisherman's dream has just come true for Peter. I mean, the dollar sign, I guess we have to say shekel signs, right? The shekel signs are coming up with, with Peter in his mind. This is going to be fantastic. Can you imagine the hall? Now, we need to put a second story before they put that shrine over the top of my house, right? We're going we're gonna to buy new bicycles or burros or donkeys, whatever for my kids. All this stuff that the money will buy. And Peter's professional reputation? Man, why fish when Peter's got this deal with this Jesus guy? Hey, would you go out and fish for me? Sure, no problem. You know, your nets will break or your money back. <laughs> I mean, this, this is everything that a fisherman, a person in business could ever imagine. And then, something at some point in this, this melee, this, this, this aquatic <laughs> chaos that's happening, something snaps in Peter's mind. And he sees the fish, and he sees the dollar signs that it represents. And he realizes at that moment that those fish and that money amount to dreams that for him were too shallow. This is not it, he realizes. I thought it was. This was my future, my boat. This is what I had planned. But it turns out that that dream was too shallow. Here standing in his boat is Jesus Christ, one that he is strongly sus suspecting is the Savior. And more than that now, he strongly suspects that this is the Creator God. Only God can do that with fish. I mean, I've heard some wild stories from fishermen, but none of it comes close to this. You can't tell a fish what to do unless you made the fish. And God himself is standing there in that boat. And Peter realizes that this is happening. And when confronted with the choice between choosing wealth or choosing Jesus, Peter gave that uniquely Peter response. He falls at the feet of Jesus and begs him to leave. Now you understand why that's a little bit uniquely Peter? I mean, picture it like this. This stool is not Jesus, but let's just imagine that it is. Peter, in essence, says this. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Okay. He falls at his feet. Don't leave. Don't leave. I know that you should and that you deserve to be able to leave me because I am just a common sinner, but please don't go. Friends, we need to understand something. Money is not evil. It's the love of money that is. That's what the Bible says. God gives wealth, God takes away wealth. Uh, history is replete with examples of it. If God blesses you with wealth, praise the Lord. God has given it to you to be a steward so that he, you, his kingdom can be advanced through how it is that you use his money. All of us get that cash just for a short time. You know, 60, 70, 80 years max, that's all we get. And it's a tool to help us to learn more about God. But if the money ever takes the place of Jesus, when we plan our futures. Guaranteed, we are headed for trouble. Sooner or later, if God is displaced and the money moves to the top, someone's gonna get hurt. It's probably for certain gonna be you and probably other people that are close to you as well. Because money is a cruel taskmaster. Jesus will set you free, but the love of money makes you a slave. And if you're thinking about your future right now, and the only thing you can think of is the cash, I want to encourage you to invert that little situation and let Jesus be back on top. Never make the choice between money and the Messiah and choose the money. Always choose the Messiah. Jesus knows best how all that money should be spent. And whether years from now or, or currently, whatever it is, whether you have lots of money or little, if Jesus is the number one determinant of your future, if he's the rudder on your boat, you will get to the right destination. But you must let him and not the cash determine your future. Which brings us to a fourth and final lesson. And we've already read verses 6 to 11 here. Let me just put this on the screen here for you. 
A fourth and final lesson for finding the right future in God is when planning your future, always plan to share Christ. When planning your future, always plan to share Christ. Did you notice what Jesus said to Peter? Peter comes, you know, gives, hugs his feet. You go away, but don't go away, right? And, and Jesus says, hey, don't worry about it. From now on, you're going to catch men. Fish, that's easy. Let's go do something a little more difficult. Let's go catch people. In other words, Jesus is asking him to become an evangelist, to become an apostle, right? And some of you right now are getting a little bit nervous because you might be thinking, well, wait, you're not going to say that, that, that God is asking us to do the same thing, right? Because Peter was special. He was one of the big 12, right? He's an apostle. He, he, was, he was a church planter, all of that. And that's not my calling. I, I'm not that kind of thing. Okay, fine. Maybe it's not. But has not God called everyone to make disciples? Yeah, everyone. Everyone gets at least one spiritual gift, right? I've never found one person who only has one spiritual gift, but everybody gets at least one. And it's through those spiritual gifts that we are to, to reach other people for Jesus, to make disciples for him. So whatever your plans are for the future, it must include sharing Jesus with other people. It has to do that. You see, we often forget that one of the primary reasons that God puts us into a certain career or, or, or a certain house or in a certain community is so that we might be his witnesses for him there. You know, too often we, we will choose a, a certain field of study or, or a certain place to live because we think it will advance, you know, some, some sort of good, good thing that has nothing to do with the ultimate mission and kingdom of God. But the truth is, is that God sees every single person we come into contact with as a candidate for his kingdom. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every single person. So if you become a scientist doing research in a lab, there will be other scientists there that need to know about Jesus. If you become a nurse who's working in a hospital, there will be other nurses and patients that need to know about Jesus. If you become a person in business, whatever that business may be, almost guaranteed that every single day you will come into contact with people who need to see Jesus, learn about Jesus, maybe even sit down and have an out and out you know, particular conversation about Jesus Christ. And in all of these situations, you will have the great privilege of being the reflector of the light of salvation through Jesus Christ. So whatever your plans end up being for the future, never forget that your first calling, as far as action is concerned, is to be a missionary wherever it is that God sends you. I'll leave you with a final story. Charles Steinmetz probably doesn't ring a bell for most people today. But if you lived at the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, uh, he was a household name. Steinmetz was an expert in electricity. Now, understand, basically in those days, that meant you were kind of an electrician today. However, Steinmetz also had an incredible mind. Uh, he understood electrical theory better than most anyone of his day on the planet. Uh, you can see pictures of him standing with Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison. I mean, he, he was a luminary of, of his day. Uh, that was all the more incredible because Steinmetz actually had some severe physical deformities. If you, if you ever see a picture of Steinmetz where he's standing, uh, it is as though his legs are about six to eight inches offset from his upper torso. Uh, he had a number of physical maladies that would have held probably most people back, but his mind, he felt, was free. And so he developed it to the absolute best of his ability. And he became this expert in electrical theory. And in those days, that was a big deal. That was a huge part of the kind of the finishing up of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, people like Henry Ford uh, used uh, principles from Steinmetz to build these huge generators, electrical generators in their plants. And it's interesting that Steinmetz and Henry Ford overlapped. Now, some have said that uh, this story has taken on some uh, uh, legendary proportions. As best I can tell, the story is true. If you look at the uh, August 16, 2011 edition of Smithsonian Magazine, there's an article there by Gilbert King, and you will find the following story. And it seems to me to be fairly well supported, so I'm going to tell it to you. Henry Ford, at his Rogue River plant outside of Dearborn, Michigan, uh, had a generator malfunction. Now, again, these were gigantic generators back in those days. And uh, the whole factory shut down. 
So Henry Ford uh, obviously sees himself hemorrhaging red ink here, and so he, he calls all of his engineers, go, go fix that thing. Well, they're there, and they're tinkering, they're twisting, they're pulling, and, whatnot, and they cannot get the thing fixed. Well, Henry Ford had heard of Steinmetz, who lived in New York at this time. And so he calls Steinmetz, he pays for his way to come over to Dearborn, Michigan, and Steinmetz gets to the plant, and they say, oh, anything you have, we can help you, we've got engineers here, you can meet with and whatnot. And Steinmetz said, thanks, but no thanks, just give me, uh, give me something to write with, a writing pad and a cot, and I'll take it from there. So they did. And he goes down to the generators, and he sits, and he listens. And then he goes up, and he walks around, he listens a little bit more, and he presses a little bit here and there. After two days of this, he calls the engineers together, and he, he takes a piece of chalk, and he marks this flap of metal, this access panel. And he said, I want you to remove this access panel, and I want you to replace 16 windings that you'll find underneath that. Okay. They did it, and the thing worked like a charm. The factory was back up, generators running marvelously. Sometime later, the bill for Steinmetz's work came to Henry Ford for $10,000. Now, that's a lot of money now, it's a lot of money back in those days. And Henry Ford, being Henry Ford, said, I admire Mr. Steinmetz, but this doesn't seem right. And so he sends it back. Steinmetz was working for General Electric at the time, uh, Schenectady, New York. And so Henry Ford sends to General Electric and says, uh, thank you for the invoice. Would you give me an itemized bill, please? Because I want to see where this money is going to, okay? To his surprise, not long later, Steinmetz himself sends him a handwritten, itemized bill. And here's what it said. Making chalk mark on generator, one dollar. Knowing where to make the mark, $9,999. Henry Ford paid the bill. Listen carefully. Too often, even amongst Christians, we educate people and we train them and we show them how to do this skill or that career or this vocation, and we end up with people who know how to make all kinds of random marks. Oh, they're good in their field. We have some, some, some fine scientists and, and, and teachers and educators and lawyers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're very good in their narrow, and, and they see what needs to be done in the scope of their profession. But when it comes to making the mark that God wants them to make with their lives, too often, they're so busy making random marks that they never make the mark that God intends. Ladies and gentlemen, let us not be those kind of people. God is calling us to make a specific mark for his kingdom. If you are successful in your particular field, praise the Lord. Amen. We're glad that you're here. May the Lord bless you with continued success in that field. And, and, Whatever your plans are for the future, may we always strive to make the mark that God wants us to. May God bless each one of us as we seek to find the future that he wants us to have. Jesus, indeed, we do want you to be our leader, Lord. Step freely into our boats. The plans that we have made, Lord, if by some reason, they are out of step with what you know would be better, what would be best for us. We pray, Lord, that you would gather us up, that you would whisper in our ear, that we would listen, and that we would follow. For indeed, Lord, there is no better future than the one that you have planned for us. We pray this in your name. Amen.